Well, we're delighted to welcome to the studio today, astronaut Tim Peake. Tim, welcome. Great to have you with us. Um, Futures Day, you're, you're here again. It's fantastic. Why is it important to you? Yes, I love Futures Day at Farnborough. Uh, to me, it's one of the most important days of the air show. Uh, over 5,000 young students will be coming here. Uh, we can demonstrate to them some of the latest exciting uh, techniques in science and engineering, some really innovative things around here. But more so than that, they get an opportunity to speak to people who are in the industry and to find out more about the possible careers that are open to them. Now, you, you do this a lot and you, you're inspiring young people to do this, what sort of future do they have there? Do they have to be test pilots or, or, or what sort of background do you need to be able to become an astronaut? Well, more so than ever now, we're taking uh, astronauts who have come from a very diverse background, not just within the European Space Agency, but if you look at our international partners in NASA, in Russia, and Canada, Japan, uh, there, there you'll find that you know you can be an engineer, you can be a scientist, you can be a medical doctor. Uh, we have school teachers who have become astronauts, so a variety of different careers. One of the common themes is, of course, you have to be passionate about space and about what you do, and you have to be good at it, which is why I'm always saying to younger students when they're asking me, of what should I do that uh, I can't tell you you need to do what you're passionate about because that's what you're going to be good at. Now your job at the moment you're not in space at the moment what are you doing? I still work full-time for the European Space Agency over in Germany at the European Astronaut Centre and I'm head of astronaut operations. So I look after the European astronauts, uh, for example, Alex Gers from Germany, he's on board the space station right now. Luca Parmitano from Italy launches next year uh, and we traditionally fly about one European astronaut per year so it's a, it's a busy job. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple of the questions. I've been talking to air cadets and to kids in schools and happened to say I was going to be talking to you. I've got some questions. I wonder if you're okay on that. Absolutely. You ran the marathon in space. What happens when you sweat? <laughs> Okay, when you sweat, a number of things happen. Firstly, on, on your legs and your arms, the sweat just forms sort of globules of moisture and it hangs there. Of course, it doesn't run off your body like it does on Earth. There's no gravity. Well, there's gravity, but we're in weightlessness. Uh, so it just stays on your arms. But on your head is where the strangest things happen because all of the sweat with the running motion and you're going up and down, all the sweat tends to form one big ball of water on top of your head. And you can feel it after about 20 minutes. You can feel this whole ball of water move moving around in your hair, which is quite uncomfortable. So we tend to have a towel and of course we just grab the towel and, and dry ourselves off as we're running. Um, but the, the, the thing that really, uh, you know, if people find quite gross is they, they, when we tell them what happens to all that sweat, because of course it's recovered by the space station systems and it goes through a purification and cleansing system and about 24 hours later it's back to drinking water. <laughs> then that takes me to the second question I was asked. What about the other bodily functions? How do you go to the toilet when you're in the space station? So other bodily functions, it is actually remarkably simple and airflow is our friend. We, we turn on uh, a fan uh, and it's like a vacuum cleaner and it just basically sucks air into it. And as long as we pee into the tube, then of course the airflow will keep everything clean and going in the right direction. And then we can recover that urine in the similar system and turn that back into drinking water as well. It does sound gross, you're absolutely right. Um, what, what frightened you or worried you during your time in the space station? Um, well, I think the, the things that we train for, the, uh, the emergency, emergency scenarios where something can go wrong, on board the space station, I think probably one of the greatest risks is depressurization, being hit by a small piece of space debris. There's an awful lot of space debris out there, not just man-made, but also natural uh, micrometeorites flying around. Uh, and if the space station were to get hit by something bigger than about one to two centimeters, it will probably go straight through and cause the station to depressurize. Um, so that's a constant threat uh, to the astronauts. Also, launch, landing, and spacewalks are the high-risk areas. Uh, and we mitigate that by just training. That they're the areas we probably focus most of our attention on to, and we train and train and train until we're perfectly comfortable with how to deal with those situations. So when you first arrived on the space station, was it different to you, I know you did train, but is it different to you would imagined it and did it, was it less sophisticated than you expected it to be? Uh, no, the training is so good that it's quite weird when you first go on board the space station. It, you feel like you've been there already. It's a home from home. You've spent so many hours training in the modules in the Johnson Space Center and European Space Agency in Russia that, that you're very familiar with your surroundings. The one thing you're not familiar with, of course, is weightlessness and the fantastic view out the windows. And they're the two things that really strike you. Did you ever get fed up with that view? 
Never. No, you never get fed up and, and there's always something different to see. Even if you're just over the middle of the Pacific Ocean, there's different weather systems, different lighting conditions, different cloud formations. There's always something new to discover. And so you're going, you're going to go back? Hopefully, the European Space Agency is, is starting to fly my class of astronauts on their second mission. So I mentioned Alex is already up there. Luca Parmitano next year from Italy goes up. And uh, after that, we hope to carry on flying about one astronaut every year. So the remainder of my classmates and myself will hopefully have a chance for a second mission, at least by 2024. And what do you think about the chances? We're talking about things like going to Mars, colonization. How do you see that happening? And do you see that as being part of your future career? It's definitely a huge part of what the European Space Agency is doing. It's part of our future, yes. We have a very strong program that set out the, the, the route to Mars, if you like, and uh, we're already manufacturing components. In fact, in a few months' time, Europe will deliver the first service module, which will be attached to the NASA's Orion spacecraft. Now, this is going to go back to the moon, into lunar orbit, and we're starting to build components which will become like a small space station going around the moon. And that will facilitate a return to the lunar surface, um, not just for short trips now. We hope to actually uh, set up permanent habitation modules on the, on the moon doing uh, long-term science. And this deep space gateway will actually also be enable Mars transportation systems. So looking ahead to 20 years, um, we, we have some really exciting Mars rover missions coming up in the next few years. But looking ahead to 20 years, we hope to get to see humans on the surface of Mars. And finally, you talk a lot about the best moments and things but what was the worst moment of that trip the worst moment uh it, honestly the, the your worst day in space is a brilliant day uh so so everything has to be put into perspective um there were a couple of hairy moments. I mean, one was the, the docking that didn't go uh, particularly well first time round, of course. So, so that, was, uh, that was a difficult moment. Um, I think the, the worst thing is just not, is missing friends and family um, from space. But, but really, I mean, every day in space is a great day. Coming back to Earth, um, sad, bumpy, or actually glad to be back on terra firma? Uh, Re-entry is very dynamic. It's again, as I said, it's one, one of the, uh, the higher risk areas of spaceflight. So there's an element of being very happy to be back on terra firma and for everything to have worked safely. Um, but it's a thrilling ride back through the Earth's atmosphere. I mean, it's, it's almost indescribable with so many different stages to it. Um, I, I think actually re-entry was more exciting than launch into space. Um, uh, but of course, you're very happy once that's all gone successfully. And yeah, there's nothing quite like, you know, for smelling and the, the smells of earth again and feeling wind on your face and, and that was that was wonderful. Great. Tim Peake, thank you so much for joining us on Fin TV. Thank, thank you. you very much.